So really quickly, because we started recording a little bit after we started presenting, for anyone who's joining us later via YouTube, we just finished talking about definitions, like what is data, what is data privacy. And I think the slides will be made available later as well. So if you would like to take a look at that, those should also be available for you to see. <clears throat> so right now we're gonna talk about how did we get here? Because I think it's important to understand why the current state of data is what it is and what historically uh, people have been saying about it. And I think a good place to start um, that's relatively long ago, but not too long ago that it's irrelevant is 1984, which was written by George Orwell. Uh, and many of you probably had to read this in high school. Uh, I somehow avoided it. I didn't have to read it. So lucky me, I guess. But this book is really influential and it's one of the most important English language books of the 20th century. And this established early fears of data collection. And for context, this was written almost immediately after World War II. Uh, it was written in the wake of totalitarianism because George Orwell was particularly scared of what a state uh, like Russia might do to control its citizens. And in 1984, he imagines a future dystopia where the government knows where you are at all times, what you're thinking. Like every TV is actually a two-way feed and like they can watch you just as you can watch them. Uh, there's thought police and it's crazy because there's mass surveillance used to control citizens. And this might be a bit different from what we think of as data collection nowadays, because nowadays we typically think about like Facebook or Google kind of watching us at all times, but this still is data collection. Um, it's still monitoring uh, like location data where you are and even preferences and behaviors via what you're thinking. So this is one of the early fears that set up uh, the modern conversation and debate about data privacy. And then if we fast forward a little bit to something more modern slightly, only by about 20 years. In 1967, there was a book published by American legal scholar Alan Weston, which I would argue is the most monumental book on the right to privacy in the modern era. Um, Weston was a lot more relevant for today's conversation because unlike Orwell, Weston had knowledge of computers. By 1967, it was starting to become accepted that computerization was going to happen and that we were seeing the dawn of the information age. And Weston realized the power that computers and particularly networked computers would have uh, to control a population through surveillance and data collection. Uh, like Orwell though, Weston was primarily concerned about government uh, overstep and like too much government power, because again, he wrote this uh, in the context of the Cold War. And Weston believed that privacy is a necessary component of free democratic societies. So he was very, uh, assertive about the idea that privacy should be treated like a human right and that there should be limits on how much data can be collected about individual citizens. And now let's go to something really recent. Uh, we have the Patriot Act in 2001. This was passed in response to the September 11th attacks. Um, and I know we joke pretty frequently about like the FBI agent watching us like, hi, Mr. FBI agent, hope you have a good night, closed laptop, like that kind of thing. But what's really happening is it's not like someone is literally watching you. Like that would require a lot of people. That would mean half the US population is watching the other half and that would be a lot of people. So that's not what's actually happening despite all the memes like my awesome meme there on the side. Um, but what it does allow is that Title II of the Patriot Act allowed for enhanced surveillance procedures. And what that means is it expanded government power to intercept private communications and particularly phone calls. Um, so if you're worried about the government listening to like a phone conversation you're having, that is a legitimate fear. Um, however, I should point out that there are very recent additions uh, to the Patriot Act and revisions. Um, there was, for example, the Freedom Act, but we're not going to cover those uh, today because we want to keep things relatively succinct. It's just important to know that 2001 was about the time that uh, the US government really expanded its power to collect data from its own citizens and even citizens abroad. And this brings us to our first important person of today is uh, Edward Snowden. And you guys probably know him because he was on the cover of like Time Magazine back in 2013. And like, literally his face was everywhere because everyone is so shocked about the uh, documents that he leaked. But in case you somehow don't know who he is, in 2013, he leaked tons of documents about the NSA surveillance program and then fled to Hong Kong and then Russia, uh, where he currently lives. He's still uh, in exile living in Russia. And a lot of people might have mixed feelings on Edward Snowden. 
some people might say he's a hero. Some people might say he's a traitor. Um, some people might say he's a whistleblower, which he would probably agree with. But it's difficult to categorize him like as a good or bad person, uh, depending on your viewpoint of uh, the U.S. intelligence community. However, uh, it's worth pointing out that in 2020, the federal court, I think it was the Ninth, Cor Ninth Circuit, yeah, Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals actually ruled in his favor, uh, somewhat vindicating him. And the ruling, which I've linked there, and you guys can click on um, the link when we share the slides later, uh, the judge ruled that the mass surveillance program that Edward Snowden exposed was in fact illegal. And the judge also asserted that the intelligence community um, and the intelligence leaders who were against Snowden and trying to suppress these information from getting out, uh, they were actually lying to the American public. So was he vindicated? Maybe. Um, we'll still have to see because right now he's obviously not allowed back in the United States. And then we get to even more modern stuff. And this is surveillance capitalism. And as you can see from the graphic I have there on the screen, pretty much everything nowadays is on the internet. Like your video games are connected to the internet, your car is on the internet, your fridge, your dog, like literally everything is on the internet. Um, and we call this surveillance capitalism because it's the idea that you are being watched and by watching you, people and specifically companies like Facebook or Google can gather data on you and use that data for a variety of purposes, which is why it has often been said that data is the new oil. But to really put a definition on this, we're going to say that surveillance capitalism is an economic system centered around the commodification of personal data. And we're going to come back to that word there, commodification, briefly, because it's a little interesting when we dig deeper. But the point I want to underline on this slide is that surveillance capitalism is pretty much unavoidable. Um, you, there's no escaping it in modern society. Like just right now, for example, um, I ha I'm wearing a Fitbit at all times. Like that is surveillance capitalism happening to some extent, right? I, I didn't read the terms of service when I bought my Fitbit. I probably should have. But that's my point is that to function in modern society, you don't have much of a say in like how you use these things. Like for example, if you look at Twitter or Facebook's terms of service, it just says, if you no longer consent to our data collection, you can delete your account. Like they're basically, that's just a fancy way of saying, all right, bye-bye, you don't like our services, well then get out of here. So it really is unavoidable because every part of our lives, every thing we do, every picture we take, um, all our preferences, everything we click online, all of that is being monitored and there's no way out of it. It's kind of just this system we've built and it's a little too late to just undo all of it in one night. Oh, sorry, I clicked on the wrong thing there. Okay. And to go on with surveillance capitalism, you've probably seen something like this before. Like when you go on a website, you'll get a really annoying pop-up at the bottom that says, we care about your privacy. Um, and specifically, if you are in California, it probably says something like this about being a California resident. Um, and this is part of what I would consider to be a government response to surveillance capitalism, is that governments like the state of California are trying to grapple with how do we protect consumer data? And we'll get more into this later, but just something that I think everyone can relate to is seeing these annoying privacy pop-up banners all over the place. Uh, and then a little more actually on surveillance capitalism being unavoidable. So I actually got this question recently while watching a YouTube video. So I'm pretty sure Google is aware that I've been recently researching data privacy and they're trying to give me not so subtle hints that they keep my personal information secure, which whether or not I believe that, I don't think I have a good choice. They're just, you know, flexing on me that they are watching me at all times. So let's talk a little bit about those government responses. Oh, uh, and really quickly, Maya brought up something in the chat. Proposition 24 does make amendments to the uh, California Consumer Protection Act. Sorry, Privacy Act, my apologies. Um, and we're not going to cover that in today's presentation because, uh, again, for the sake of time. However, I hope that by learning a little bit about privacy today that you can do your own research and find out whether you support it or don't support it, that is up to you, it is your vote. But to go back to this slide, 
So the government responses um, to data privacy becoming a more important issue to people. Uh, the European Union passed the General Data Protection Regulation, which is uh, shortened as GDPR in 2016. And I think it went into effect in 2018 or 2019, so pretty recent. California, as I just mentioned, also passed CCPA, but it's still being worked out. So Proposition 24, please look into it. And other countries are also doing their own thing. So New Zealand has a privacy commissioner and that's like a dedicated government position. Uh, Germany also has something similar to that and so does Singapore. And I put a link there to a Senate hearing that I watched. And yes, I sat through a Senate hearing. It was very boring, but it's important to be aware of these things. And the fact of the matter is that there isn't really a national framework for the United States on protecting and securing the privacy of data. What we really have is like a patchwork of laws. So we have like state by state regulations about how to protect healthcare records because like patient privacy or like telecommunication records. But there's no cohesive like legal framework that governs all of these things that we consider personal data. It's kind of like a case by cases. And that makes it really messy to deal with personal data uh, and protecting personal data in the United States. However, um, that Senate hearing I put there, which was in 2019, which was, um, for those of you who don't know, the magical before time of COVID, um, they talked about uh, what it might mean to create a federal uh, framework for regulating data privacy uh, and data valuation, which is what we're going to talk about next, actually. Oh, sorry, before we go on a super brief overview of CCPA, because um, you should know your rights. You have the right to know about the personal information a business collects about you and how it's used or shared. You have the right to delete personal information collected from, uh, from you. Uh, you can opt out of the sale of your personal info, which is why you see those banners and they'll say, click here if you do not want us to sell your personal data, but then they make it really super confusing about like whether checking the box makes it so they can't or can't. Um, and then you're also supposed to enjoy non-discrimination for exercising your uh, CCPA rights. Okay. Um, and this is an interesting proposition that I wanted to talk about today because it is at least tangentially related to the idea of data privacy, which is data as property. And this is a very uh, new way of thinking about data, I think. Um, and not a lot of people are talking about it, but it is something that we should consider. So another important person that I want to bring up is Andrew Yang, and he was a former presidential candidate for the Democratic Party. And after dropping out of the race, he launched the Data Dividend Project, and his hot button issue was property rights for personal data. He talked about it pretty much constantly. That is the entire aim of the Data Dividend Project. But let's kind of dig into what does property rights for data mean? And this is gonna get like really weird because we have to get into defining what property means and everything. And that can be like a hairy thing to tackle, but we're gonna to try to do it anyway. So what is property? Uh, from this paper uh, written in 2004 by another privacy scholar, uh, he, Paul Schwartz writes that Pri uh, property, sorry, property is any interest in an object, whether tangible or intangible, that is enforceable against the world. And that might sound like a really vague definition, but that's on purpose because property is a really malleable construct. It's not like some physical constant of the universe. It's a thing that humans made up. And now I'm not here to debate whether communism or capitalism is the right way to go. I'm not here to debate whether property should exist, but I feel like that this definition it works pretty well considering all the ways that humans can define property. So some examples that I picked here that I think will show you that this definition works well for both of them uh, is like a house, for example. Uh, this is what we would consider like regular property. Like very few people would dispute the fact that if you purchase a house, that it is your property. Um, and this is an interest in an object because you have an interest in living in your house, presumably, or maybe renting it out. And it is definitely tangible. Your house is a real object that is enforceable against the world. And it 100% is enforceable. Um, if someone intrudes on your house, you have every right to kick them out, call the police, whatever. It is your house. It's enforceable property, right? Uh, we can talk about patents too, which are intellectual property. 
And this might be a little bit more intangible because a patent is kind of like an idea, like an invention or a song, I think are all pat, no, songs aren't patentable. I think colors are though. But anyway, a patent, um, right? That's an example of intellectual property. And that is an interest in an object that is enforceable against the world. Because if someone infringes upon your patent, um, you have you know, the judicial system to back you up and say, hey, no, this is my invention. Um, and it's interesting to note actually that under this definition that Schwartz proposes, you could actually think of data as if it's like already proper. Oh, um, let's see here. Tyler asks, is copyright a form of patent? Um, I want to give a full disclosure that I am not an expert in like copyright law. I'm not a, a like pre-law uh, person, like I'm CS major, so not an expert. However, I would say that copyright is like a, a way of, you could think of copyright kind of like property. Yeah. Because again, this definition is intentionally very broad as I'm uh, going to explain right now that Schwartz defines property this way because he argues that under this definition, you could actually say that data is already property. Um, so for example, when Facebook has data about like what pages you like, uh, whose photos you're posting or whatever, um, that is all your personal data. And Facebook has an interest in that data because that's how they make money. Uh, it's intangible or maybe it is tangible. Um, you can actually have a whole debate on whether data is tangible or intangible, but for now, let's say it's intangible and it is enforceable against the world because what happens when a data leak happens? Uh, Facebook goes to court, as we'll talk about later. When a data leak happens, there is legal there are legal repercussions. So it is definitely an enforceable interest in an object. Um, at the same time though, uh, data is different from traditional property. And I think it helps to go through an analogy to understand why. So let's say you buy a backpack, like you buy this really cute red backpack here and you buy it on Amazon. I know you should support local businesses, but I just, Amazon is the best example I could think of. Okay, so let's say you buy this backpack on Amazon. It is 100% your property. You know, it shows up at your door, you unbox it. Great, you've got a backpack. If someone else wants to buy the same exact backpack from you, so not like another model of this red backpack, they want the exact red backpack that you have. So if you bought backpack number 687, they want backpack number 687. They have to buy it from you. There's no one else who owns that backpack. It's definitely yours. But let's imagine Facebook in comparison. Let's say you like a lot of horror movie pages because it's Halloween season and Facebook uses that data and they sell ad slots to Netflix and they say, hey, this person really likes horror movies. So why don't we show them some, uh, why don't we let Netflix show them some ads for horror movies that are on Netflix? And then they can do the same thing again for Hulu. Now, what just happened there is that Facebook sold the same thing twice. You can't really do that with like traditional property. You can't sell a house twice because you can't have two people owning a house at the same time. It's either my house or your house. But for data, it's not the same. In fact, you could even say that data violates our traditional understanding of uh, a capitalist business model in that there's supply and demand, right? What's the supply of data? Isn't it infinite since you could just infinitely reproduce data? And what's the demand of data? Like who wants to be buying, like do you guys wanna be buying my personal data? Maybe you do, but I would presume most of you not. Um, so it really is different from property in the traditional way we think about it. Yet at the same time, it's obvious that data is treated like property in other regards. So let's quickly step through some of these arguments um, for and against data propertization. So one argument for it is that property implies legal responsibility. So if we propertize data, like formally, um, and you don't want some party to have access to your data. So let's say, I don't know, like Facebook has your data and they sell it to someone, but you don't want that someone to have it. Uh, well, you legally own your data so you can revoke access and you can force them to delete it, maybe sue for property damages. This is a little vague here, depending on how you define property. But the general idea is that with property rights comes greater legal rights. So you are entitled to compensation. And I'm sounding like a lawyer commercial, but you get the point. 
if you bestow property rights upon data, you can do a lot more in terms of like getting recourse for it if it's misused or mishandled. And another, um, another argument in favor of propertizing data is talking about property and power. Like we discussed earlier, there's no meaningful choice to avoid data collection in the modern world. You, you really can't get away from it. Everyone is watching you, everyone's collecting data on you. And what that means is that tech companies get to exert a lot of power in deciding what the rules are. Um, and some people might be like, oh, easy solution, delete Facebook. Yeah, but that like removes so many opportunities and avenues to connect with other people. Like in some regards, Facebook still is a pretty useful service. I just don't like the way that they collect my data. Um, so then you might go and say, well, if that's the case, then just join another social media platform. Okay, so then I go to Twitter. Well, Twitter does the same thing. Well, then I go to Reddit. Well, then Reddit does the same thing. And then you say, well, then go to an open source social media platform, which believe it or not, some of those exist. No, I don't remember what they're called because they're not famous. And that's the point is that social media companies and their value is directly correlated with how many users are on the platform. Like it's not useful if you have a social media network, but like you're the only person on it. So they kind of have a monopoly actually, because once you're on their platform and once enough people are on their platform, unless everyone collectively decides at the same exact moment, we're all going to leave. It doesn't really matter if just one person leaves because where are they going to go? What can they do? So this argument here is that by not defining formal legal property rights for data, what ends up happening is that companies get to decide uh, de facto property rights. So it's not like legally recognized, but they get to treat it however they want to do because no one can say anything. It's like, we really don't have a choice here. Now, there is a very important con though against propertizing data and that is valuing data is rather difficult. And for this, I made an arbitrary distinction between three types of data. This was not like on Wikipedia. This is something that I kind of made up, but I think is useful as a way of understanding uh, the different ways personal data can be uh, looked at. So one is volunteer data where you put in the work. So for example, in that very non-threatening survey that Google sent to me when I was watching YouTube, I have to do the work. I have to volunteer data about whether or not I think Google keeps my information secure and private. So I'm volunteering that data. Observed data is created just by existing. So when I'm walking around with my Fitbit, uh, when I'm clicking around on YouTube, like figuring out which video to watch next, that's observed data. I don't really have to do anything. It's just some machine or computer or whatever is watching me in the background and just like kind of taking notes. And then there's inferred data where the data collector has to do the work. So inferred data is kind of created actually by looking at volunteered and observed data. So based on how I respond to survey questions, based on the videos I click on YouTube, YouTube's uh, engineering team might say, oh, based on this, we think you fit into this category of viewers. So these are the videos we're gonna recommend to you. And the question that I pose is, where do properties fall if you can divide up data like this? Because is data useful just by me volunteering it? Is it useful because I exist? Or is it useful because someone went and did analysis on it? And like, what would a free market for data even look like? Um, so it's just really weird to be thinking about which one of these three, like where does the value go? Um, do I attach a price tag? So for example, if Google asks me a survey again, do I say, hey, I need you to pay me $5 for me to give an answer to this question. Or if I put on a Fitbit, I tell Fitbit, like the company, not my watch. I tell the company, I'm gonna charge you guys money to you know, provide health analytic data on me. Well, that doesn't really make any sense because then the companies would say, well, then where are we making money? Like, why are we in, even in business then? Uh, but if we're talking about propertizing the inferred data and we're saying, hey, we want money on the inferred data, did we really deserve that property right? Because we didn't, like we provided the raw data, but we didn't process it. And I think a helpful analogy for this is to think about oil. When you pump oil out of the ground, it's, it's like crude oil, right? Like it can't be used for a lot of purposes. So it has to be refined 
And what you and I pay for is the refined stuff. Inferred data is like that refined stuff. Um, someone else had to do the work and it's not 100% clear if that makes it our data still, because if they put in work to it, doesn't that kind of make it third data too? And that makes it really difficult. And again, this is another uh, property breaking notion that data comes with, which is we typically think of property as belonging to solely one person, but with data, it might belong to multiple people at the same time, actually. Um, although I should be clear that this is more of a hypothetical. Just because something's difficult doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. I'm just bringing up counter arguments here. This is what some people are saying. And another one, which is relevant, like super relevant for today's discussion, is that privacy is a human right. And some people will argue that selling your data is equivalent to surrendering your right to privacy. And that leads down an interesting rabbit hole of thought that gets very gruesome. If the rich can pay for privacy, but the poor people can't, what happens? Don't we kind of create like a privacy classes society where it's like, oh, well, I'm rich, so I can afford my privacy, but you can't. So sucks to be you. And as an analogous example, you can't just sell your organs because broadly speaking, again, I'm not a lawyer, so please don't take my advice. If you want to sell your kidney or something, just don't do that, please. Broadly speaking, you have a right to your own body, right? We just agree that it's like your body, that's a human right. Like we can't like forcibly remove your organs because that would be crazy. In the same way, if privacy is a human right, you really shouldn't be able to sell a human right. You shouldn't be able to sell that ability to remain private. That should be something that you are entitled to, not something that is conditional upon your ability to pay for it, right? Like you don't pay for your ability to, um, and I don't, I don't know what the United Nations Human Rights Declaration says, but any of those things, basically, you don't pay for, the, for those rights. They're given to you. So uh, people who argue this position will say that propertizing data would only formalize the process by which you can sell it, which would uh, imply that you're selling your right to privacy. Uh, and then we have some discussion questions here. Um, do we have breakout rooms on the next slide or not? No, we don't. Okay. So for these discussion questions, I'm just going to show them to you now, but we can talk about them um, at the end when we're going to have breakout rooms. These are just some thoughts that I want you guys to be kind of pondering based on what I've presented. Uh, you can totally disagree with a, lot of, with a lot of the things I've said actually, but um, something to think about is like, should data be propertized? And if so, what would your propertization scheme look like? And if no, then you know, why not? Okay, I'm gonna hand it off to Amy now for the, uh, we're gonna go into some case studies um, on COVID contact tracing. Can you guys see my screen? Okay. Yeah, I can see it. So um, for today's discussion, we're going to kind of go into specific topics that are um, pretty relevant to all of our lives so that everyone can have a chance to say something. Um, like Jason said, we will be breaking it up into breakout rooms after going over these case studies. So the first one we wanted to explore is COVID contact tracing. Um, there's been a lot of debate about whether this is an invasion of privacy and um, the collection of data of locations and like where people have been um, is generally for the um, good of like the public, uh, like for public health, but it's at a cost of privacy for each individual. So it raises a lot of questions on whether this is an ethical use of technology. Um, and obviously a lot of countries are taking um, different approaches to this. One country we wanted to take note of is South Korea, which has been famous for um, using a lot of location tracking, looking at security cameras, even digging into people's credit card transactions to record where they've been to warn people in the vicinities they were in that they were exposed to COVID. Um, a lot of this comes down to cultural differences in countries, um, obviously in more Western areas like the United States, um, privacy is regarded um, very heavily and a lot of people value their privacy. But in a case where um, kind of 
losing your privacy would keep everyone safe in terms of like public health levels, is that worth, um, like, is it worth it to lose your privacy so that everyone can stay safe and not get this virus? Or is our privacy really important that we shouldn't go further into this contact tracing? Um, this is a quote from Jung, who was a former CDC director in South Korea, who basically talked about um, how different Western countries are in approaching something like contact tracing. So this will be a really interesting topic for you guys to delve into in your breakout rooms. So some questions we want you guys to think about is, um, to what extent is government surveillance necessary? Um, are there cases in which data collection is never okay? Um, now we're gonna move on to a different case study, which is targeted ads. And we're gonna go back to surveillance capitalism, which is what Jason had went over earlier. And obviously you guys all know Mark Zuckerberg, um, you know, founded Facebook, you guys all know him. So I'm gonna skip to the next slide. We're gonna go over some conversations that were recorded about him. This was back in 2003 to 2005. So it's been a long time ago, but um, this was just a message that was recorded. Basically Zuckerberg was admitting how much information he has, as you can see, um, but it's kind of strange as to how different his responses are now in the present day. If you see this excerpt, um, you can see that he's kind of admitting that people are scared about the security of their privacy. And he says that um, people expect their private communications to be secure and to only be seen by the people they sent them to. Um, a really important part of this is that people don't really expect the people that are operating these services to see what they're sending. And that's something we will talk about um, in the breakout rooms as well. Another important aspect of something that he said is how technology is centralizing power in the hands of governments and big tech giants like Facebook, Google, et cetera. Um, again, this is another um, result of big data and how much it's affecting like capitalism and basically the state of our economy. And if that these big tech giants have all these um, like resources and data on everyone, then they basically have power over everyone. And just like Jason mentioned earlier, um, we don't really have a choice because everything we do like through Facebook, um, online here on Zoom, especially with online school, like everything's online and we can't really avoid it. Um, something really important that happened in 2018 was um, the scandal with Cambridge Analytica and Facebook. Um, basically, Facebook leaked their data and Cambridge Analytica was able to extract all that data and create these profiles of everyone. And that influenced a lot of um, politics worldwide, also in the US, of course. Um, because they had all this data, they were able to um, send out like advertisements that are very personalized to people regarding politics. Um, but what was interesting about this incident was that um, Facebook was targeted for the security, which is um, like the data security and not the data privacy because um, their system was not secure enough in that all their data leaked. So what ended up happening was that Facebook had to pay out um, a $5 billion fine to settle this FTC investigation. Um, which is kind of interesting because Cambridge Analytica was the one um, creating all these fake profiles and, but Facebook was the one that was put on the spot. Um, Christopher Wiley, who was the whistleblower of this said that his goal was to protect democratic institutions from rogue actors and hostile foreign interference, as well as ensure the safety of Americans online. Um, this definitely brought notice to the general public about how much data Facebook has on each one of us. And um, I know personally, a lot of close friends and family members chose to completely delete Facebook because of this incident. Um, but as college students, I feel like Facebook is definitely a really important tool. So once again, we really have no choice but to use it. 
So some discussion questions about this is, um, what makes a virtual space different from the real world? Um, if you think about it, there's always bots or other computers tracking what you're doing online. But if you think about that situation in real life, there's not someone who's always following you. Um, we can get into this in more detail in your breakout rooms. So I believe Jason has opened the rooms. Uh, yeah, so I'm about to create the bit breakout rooms. Um, definitely, we want to hear your guys' thoughts first. So if there's anything that stuck out to you from the presentation, please share that in your breakout room. But if there's nothing that you want to talk about, we will have discussion facilitators who have a list of the questions that we presented on the slides. So don't worry, there'll definitely be things to talk about. Uh, so I'm going to open these up now and you can join them. Okay, so let's wrap up. There are further readings if you're interested. Um, so we put some links here. There's an overview of like data privacy at the top. Uh, we linked the full text of GDPR and CCPA if you want to read through all of it, like the policy nerds you are. Um, I linked the Amazon page for privacy and freedom, which I highly recommend. Really good read, even though it is kind of dated. And then just as a self-promotion, I linked my own blog article on an overview of data propertyization because I'm egoistic like that. <laughs> but please, uh, I, um, just check some of these out. We think that there's a lot more you can learn beyond just what we presented today. And the attendance code is big data. So for those of you who are ACM members, you can log into your account and submit the attendance code. I'll leave that on the screen for just a little bit longer. All right, and moving on. Feedback uh, and ideas forum. We would love to hear what you thought about today's workshop. Um, we'd also love to hear ideas for future things you wanna talk about. Again, impact is all about talking uh, talking to talk about, you know, uh, the social impact of tech policy, all that sort of good stuff, because these are difficult conversations that we do need to be having since tech is such a big impact on our lives. And then links, uh, ACM at UCLA links, Facebook link for next time that's there. Uh, and again, please sign up for our mailing list, check us out on Facebook, all that. And I think that's it. Yeah, that is. So I'm going to stop screen sharing. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Uh, this was really great. Loved hearing your thoughts about data privacy.